Philosophically speaking, Carl Schmitt was the most serious of the German political theorists that supported Nazism. He joined the party in 1933 when Hitler became chancellor and served in government positions, but he was publicly criticized by the SS in 1936, so held no more government posts. But he continued to teach till the end of the war. Refusing to renounce his former views, he was barred from teaching after the Second World War. But long before 1933, starting in the early 1920s, he had begun to lay out the rationale for a kind of politics that was incompatible with the struggling, struggling liberalism of the Weimar Republic. His thought raises deep questions about the very concept of politics and the basis of political authority. Schmidt presented a critique of liberal republicanism, or what he called parliamentary democracy. First of all, Schmidt points out that parliamentarism is not, as its advocates believe, a discussion about truth. It's a negotiation over interests. That is, it doesn't have the virtue of searching for truth or what's best for society, as some philosophers like Kant or Miller Dewey had hoped. It's simply a bidding war among interest groups. That's all. He recognized, as we've noted in other thinkers, that democracy and parliamentarism, or liberalism, are in conflict. Democracy is about power, and its purest form is direct democracy. Parliamentarism is about limiting power, checks and balances. Plebiscitary democracy, a plebiscite is a kind of referendum, Plebiscitary democracy, which is direct, is the true spirit of democracy. It's the public formation of the will of the people and can be better done in acclamation than in secret ballot. So Schmidt is admitting to admiration for democracy in its direct plebiscitary form, but not for liberal republicanism or parliamentarism. He accused liberal parliamentary government of relativism, that is, it relativizes all interests and claims. He quotes Karl Kautsky in the following, quote, the awareness of relative truths never gives one the courage to use force and to spill blood, end quote. What he's implying is that politics, as we'll see later, is really about making an ultimate decision, declaring an absolute commitment. Liberalism pretends that politics can avoid such decisions. That's his view. Now, Schmidt argued parliamentarism was now, in 1923, bankrupt, destined to be superseded in one of two directions, by Marxist communism or by the viewpoint of Sorel and Mussolini. Marxism, he claimed, is a rationalist, enlightenment, educational dictatorship, dictatorship by those who know the Communist Party. Mussolini's is an irrationalist, mythical approach to politics. Now, at this point, Schmidt was, before the Nazis really existed or were a power, a supporter of the temporary dictatorial powers of the presidency. Not to supplant, but to protect democracy. So at this point, his practical goal was to increase the executive powers of government against parliament, which he saw as unable to deal with Germany's problems. But now let's go deeper. Liberals tend to think of politics as a servant to economics. Parliamentarism tends to think of the essence of politics as law. But Schmidt argued that the very concept of the political is not moral or legal or social or economic. It's beyond all of them. Politics is deeper and more profound than law or economics or civic morality. It is a matter of our very existence. In a very interesting argument, Schmidt says, the sovereign is he who decides on the exception. This is on, from an essay called Political Theology. He operates a bit like later postmodernists, as we'll see, by taking the dominant view that he's opposing, then pulling on one little thread of it to show that it leads to a truer answer. We remember that even proto-liberals like Locke admitted that the executive power must be permitted prerogative, the power to suspend the law if necessary for the good of the polity, particularly in an emergency like a war. That was the role of the dictator way back in Republican Rome. Imagine not the everyday situation of a liberal republic, but an emergency situation. When the country's being, losing a war or being overrun, 
who gets to decide whether or not to surrender? Someone will decide, maybe the president, maybe someone else. The concept of prerogative was seen in the Republican tradition as a kind of necessary safety valve for use in occasional extreme situations, especially in an older world where transportation by horse, uh, of transportation by horse, where gathering a quorum in a legislature might take weeks. But Schmidt takes this more seriously, this little safety valve. To alter the laws or suspend them in an extreme situation is an awesome power. Very well. What Schmidt suggests is this. Whoever decides the exception, the emergency situation beyond law, and can impose that decision is in fact the sovereign. Everything else is window dressing and mere discussion. Sovereignty is supposed to be the ultimate political power. That's an old idea from the 16th century Frenchman, Jean Baudin. But what's the most extreme case of such power? The emergency, when all lower or less ultimate political structures and powers are in abeyance or are too weak to decide. So the sovereign, whoever we call the sovereign, is in fact the wielder of the ultimate power to decide the exception or the emergency cases. Schmidt is looking at the limit or border of the political, something far from everyday politics, and saying that, to put it metaphorically, it's the border that constitutes politics. The people are not the sovereign. The people is a huge mass. For them to decide is an enormous operation of people going to voting booths. Who's the real sovereign power? Whoever the people trust to decide the emergency cases. But now press the argument in another inevitable step. Who gets to decide that there is an emergency in the first place? Schmidt pulls on that thread harder. That too must be the sovereign. We should admit that he who has the power to decide the emergency ought to have the power to decide whether there is an emergency. You see where this is going. The implication is that the essence of political power is the ability to suspend normal law and declare more martial law. That's sovereignty. For Schmidt, the law is not sovereign. We are not ruled by laws. We follow laws and are obligated to do so in normal social conditions. But that's not ruling. That's not political. For the sovereign who decides the exception is the precondition of the law being obligatory and being, in fact, obeyed. Notice, this is Hobbesian. Government is the precondition of the law's validity, and so can't be subject to it. Schmidt is searching for foundations for everyday politics, and he finds them not in natural law or rational ethics, but in those ultimate decisions that initiate and maintain the state. Notice he is also pushing the notion of the political to the point of a pre- or non-rational existential decision on which political rationality, law, and structure are based. What Schmidt means is, rational arguments are always based in premises of presupposition. What gives us the truth of the preposition, uh, presuppositions? Presumably another argument with other presuppositions. But then what comes first? Whatever it is cannot be the product of a rational argument. If it was, then we'd have to turn to those presuppositions. The first presupposition can only be a non-rational decision, a pure commitment without argument. Schmidt is saying that the constitutional legal state, the Rechtsstaat of Hegel, must ultimately be based in something pre-constitutional, pre-legal, and even pre-rational. If non-rational, this, this, begin, this begins to sound a bit like religious faith. And indeed, in his essay, Political Theology, Schmidt argues that modern political concepts are essentially earlier theological concepts secularized. That is, the politics of the modern sovereign state takes the place of religion in declaring the fundamental grounding and legitimation of any social form of life. He doesn't mean the state is holy or the object of religion. He means that just as in the metaphysical domain, the concept of God serves as the ultimate ground of things, which must be the object of faith on which everything else is based. In modern political theory, in practical social life, concepts of the sovereign have traditionally been inspired by religion. Before the rise of liberalism, 
the sovereign was conceived on analogy with God, or as a servant of God, or as a representative of God. His claim is not that this was true, that this earlier view was, was actually factually correct, but the fact that the analogy was used is revealing. For it's true that the sovereign has to be the object of the ultimate pre-rational decision, the object of basic faith in the practical and social domain. Otherwise, there's no sovereignty, no stable, legitimate public order. He is rejecting the whole development of the non-religious natural law tradition. He is re-theologizing it, but without God. In fact, he refers back to Demestia, who you may remember, for the sovereign is the inheritor of divine infallibility in a very practical sense. There can be no appeal from the sovereign's decisions. Later on, in his essay, The Concept of the Political, Schmidt deals with the interstate context of sovereignty. He asks the fundamental question, what is politics? Again, for him, politics can't be economics or culture or law or society. Those aren't basic. It has its own unique character, which has something to do with power and something to do with membership in a political community. Politics, he claims, is the relation to the public enemy, as opposed to a private enemy. A private enemy would be my neighbor who lets his dog defecate in my yard. But politics is the relation between mutually exclusive and hostile political communities or publics, with respect to which, if one has their way or will, fulfill, or will fulfilled, the other is destroyed. Politics is based in the will to fight for one's community's existence against an enemy. This is a real relation to a real outside power, a hostis, to use the Greek, or a hostile foreign community. The communities are mutually exclusive. The question is, which will continue to exist? That, he says, is politics. Politics is thus inherently dangerous because man is dangerous. That is, human beings are evil, by which Schmidt means they're dangerous and dynamic. They are not pacific or law-governed. Without a willingness to fight, there's no politics at all. The fight is for one's own existence, and the decision to fight is thus existential, an absolute yes or no, an act of pre-rational self-assertion. Those familiar with the philosophy of existentialism from the 20th century can hear some notes of its melody of resolute commitment, which would, will actually be embodied in the philosophy of Martin Heidegger and his book Being in Time, published in 1927, which was the source of all 20th century existentialism. Failure to recognize the true nature of politics, liberal internationalist parliamentar parliamentarians who try to decide all questions by law, which is to say by parliamentary discussion, by trying to, they try to defang and tame politics, but in so doing, they expose the state to dangers of factions like Bolsheviks and fascists who would take over. Schmidt is literally arguing that liberal republicanism is not a political doctrine of view. It's a negation of politics, an attempt to replace politics, which is dangerous, with pacific law or morality or economics. He specifically ridiculed the League of Nations, the precursor to the United Nations, which was set up after the Versailles Treaty at the end of the First World War to ensure world peace. World government and world peace are the end or the goal of the political from that point of view. And in fact, he argues, liberal parliamentar parliamentarians are more brutal and exclusive without admitting or recognizing the fact. For in their humanitarian conception of politics, which is supposed to exclude no one, who are their enemies or opponents? For the humanitarian liberal, whoever opposes him is seen not as human at all, is an enemy of all humanity, if I'm a humanitarian, hence not deserving of respect. Because they regard that as liberals regard themselves as representing morality, uh, moral legal humanism, Liberal societies regard their enemies as anti-human, as the devil, to be treated as enemies of all humanity, which is worse than treating them as a mere enemy. What to make of this philosophically? Schmidt 
is one of a short list of 20th century political philosophers obsessed with the deep issue of what grounds or validates politics itself, given the rejection of any natural law tradition. In effect, what justifies it is something like Nietzsche's will to power. He's going outside the modern tradition that has based itself on trying to find ways to limit the political, to yoke the political to the service of society in definite ways, to construct laws or natural laws, moral theory like utilitarianism, as a framework that gives sovereignty and power and limits it. Schmidt wants to release it, release the political uh, from the various things have been stuck around it by the modern, most of the modern political tradition. Now notice what's happening. Liberal republicanism, for all those mentioned, appears weak and ineffectual. It seems to have no strength or unity. It lacks decision. It lacks spiritual meaning. It lacks spiritual meaning because it encourages a society where individuals pursue their self-interest. Theoretically, it seems to be grounded, groundless. Okay. Uh, the search for a ground to political life leads to power, existential decision, a theology of the nation state, which is unlimited. That's what Schmidt tells us. This may sound Hobbesian, but Hobbes did not found the sovereign on a non-rational basis. For Hobbes, the sovereign is still the creation of rational, self-interested people. Schmidt is more Nietzschean than Hobbesian. As sociologist Edward Schills wrote later, fascism was nationalist, but not simply nationalist. Schills argued that societies can base themselves in two kinds of myths at the same time, from below or from above. That is, from nature, the earth, their land or territory, for example, that's the nation, or base them on the will of God or the gods, the transcendent. Schills believed fascism transcendent, transcendentalized the nation, treated the nation as if it were a transcendent divine source unifying the two. This is a nice reflection of Schmidt's notion that sovereignty is a quasi-theological idea. The political community is sovereign is a theological notion of the nation state. 